right uh, so yes so emily has kindly agreed to be with us and uh, emily's research lies in the area of gender in higher education particularly the production of knowledge about gender the academic profession academic mobility and conferences post structuralist and feminist theory and research methodologies uh, emily's current research project uh, includes a five year project on gender in higher education in the state of haryana india and emily it would be interesting to know more about this this is quite interesting since we are this meeting you for the first time uh, and in two places at once uh, a study of the impact of caring responsibilities on academics conference participation she also tweets from her account emily frasketor i'm going to sort of mention that in the chat box so thank you emily for being with us the forum is all yours pleasure and um, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation ekta um i uh, i have a kind of special um place for for tis um which is partly why i agreed um to do this at such um, late notice because um when i was uh, i spent a few months in mumbai back in 2010 uh before i did my masters actually and um i was really welcomed at tis and i did a bit of research assistance work for lata narayan and i got to know um as well the queer uh, labia collective i was part of that when i was there which also has a strong connection with tis so um anything that tis would ask i would normally say yes so, um that's uh, i'm always happy to share uh, my work um with tis so thank you again for the invitation and it looks like you've got a great event happening here and it's also such a pleasure because obviously i can't travel to india at the moment and i'm really missing the kind of interaction with the uh, with my international colleagues so uh, lovely to meet a new um colleague and also interact with some people um so um i was um, specifically asked to talk about my research um on diary method um today i think that's part of your um kind of aim to have innovative um methodologies showcased um i'm just going to put my timer on um so i've been asked to talk for approximately half an hour and then we can have some questions and discussion um so um the presentation um is uh, going to involve three three parts uh, firstly the introduction to diary research i'm not sure how familiar you are with diary research um, but i will just introduce the main parts of it and i'm also going to introduce a project in which i've used diary research uh, which ekta mentioned in her introduction to the into places at once project um and i'm going to finish with some reflections on using diary research during covid and that's because um diary research has suddenly experienced quite a lot of uh, popularity um because it is um something you can do without doing in person field work um but i want to think both positively and also critically about whether we should be reaching for diaries in this moment and the uh, both the introduction to diary research and also the project uh, that I'll be talking about are are included in our new book which is coming out in March um which is an edited collection about exploring diary methods in higher education research it also includes a really fascinating chapter by uh, Dr Nidhi S Sabawal who's based at NIPA in Delhi thinking about using diaries to research marginalized students in indian higher education which may be of interest to some of you as well um so i want to also just recognize the contribution of my wonderful colleague jui mang tao who is the co-editor of the book and some of these slides um, we've developed together um over time um to to present in different places uh, so i need to recognize her contribution to uh, some of these slides as well So um I want to uh, begin my introduction to diary research by um saying that um diary method is not um really a mainstream method it's not like a completely unknown method either but it's not um you know if you were to list the main methods that are used in social sciences research you know you'd probably say interview questionnaire maybe observation Uh, I don't think you would reach for diary as one of your maybe top 10 methods. Um on the other hand it's not completely unknown. So it's somewhere in that gray area of um research methods that people know about but often don't actually choose. Um 
which is why um, this is from Hayer's uh, work, um, which is an introduction to diary method, a whole book on that. Um, she says it's somewhat off the beaten path, a bit mysterious, even kitschy. Alazuski in another book, there are very few books on, whole books on diary research, so there are three main ones. Alazuski in his work notes that the literature on the use of diaries is growing, but it just doesn't match the other methods. So um, as I say, it's sort of somewhere down there on the top list of methods to be used. And Bartlett and Milligan, and I will, by the way, show you the full references list at the end if anyone's interested. Um, Bartlett and Milligan note that everyone understands the idea of a diary. Lots of us have kept a diary for various reasons and in various ways. And that's something that's quite important about diary method uh, people have you know, their actual calendars or their electronic diaries or the paper diaries they use to schedule their lives. But lots of people also keep diaries for, their, for recording their personal experiences. So diaries have something familiar about them, but they're not that familiar as a research tool. So how do we uh, balance between this sort of familiarity and unfamiliarity? And that's something that Shui Meng Tao and I have been doing in our edited collection. So a, a very important distinction um, to bring in when introducing diary research is that there are two main types of diaries, unsolicited and solicited. So solic uh, unsolicited diaries are those that you find or that have been already written. Um, so often that can be archive work where you dig out um, someone's diary from anything up to 10 or 200 years and, um, and analyze that as a kind of artifact. Um, and this kind of diary research is more common in uh, historical research. So the important thing is that you as the researcher are not asking this diary to be produced, you're finding it. Um, and generally this would be a qualitative um, study because you'd be studying a text and generally it would be a kind of standalone object because generally you can't interview the person who wrote it. It's like a found um, diary. Um, this, uh, this field of study is kind of growing in interesting and new ways. And this is one of the ways in which uh, there's potential during COVID. It depends what we call a diary. Uh, but there's quite a lot of scope for analysing people's um, blogs, for example, and people who are writing almost public diaries these days of whether it's their social media records, their Facebook um, timeline, um, their um, or, or a personal blog site. And that's where you do tread a bit of an interesting line of ethics, you know, because there's information that's publicly out there. But as researchers, we should normally still ask permission um, from whoever's written it to actually use it and analyze it in our research. But that's, um, that's unsolicited diaries. And the kind of diaries that I'm focusing more in my presentation and that I think will be of more use to, to any of you thinking about this method is solicited diaries. And solicited diaries are ones that are actually produced for research purposes. So that means that the um, researcher is actually um, recruiting participants and designing some kind of diary um, that the participants will then fill in and return to them. And actually, um, although we might think with a diary of a kind of a notebook with lots of words in it, actually there are lots of different kinds of diaries and therefore they can fulfill any kind of um, epistemological and theoretical position that you come from, whether you're a kind of hardcore economist um, or a, a psychologist or a feminist sociologist, you can find a diary that fits the way that you're working. Um, and they can be quantitative and qualitative. Um, you know, you can actually have diaries that ask you to write down um, how many hours you slept last night, or um, they can ask you um, if you remember to take your uh, medication and you just say yes, no, or um, these sorts of um, health related diaries can be quite quantitative in nature, as well as qualitative, much more asking about your experiences and reflections. And solicited diaries are often used 
alongside other methods such as interviews or particularly interviews are most common but other forms as well um, and that's because usually you can actually enhance the value of the diary by talking to the interviewee the participant about what they wrote and why they wrote it so these are our main two types of diaries so if we zoom in a bit more on solicited diaries um, as I said, they can be framed in totally different ways according to your epistemological um, position. They can be highly structured going through a range of questions with yes, no or multiple choice answers, or they can be completely unstructured where you're simply asked, you know, a, sing a single question, write about your experiences of discrimination in higher education, for example, go, or they can be semi-structured and asked for more of a kind of, please ensure you answer these questions each time. They can take so many different forms, and this is where there's a, a kind of blurring of the idea of a diary. Um, what counts as diary research? And there's some disagreement around this. Um, the most obvious one is a kind of paper booklet or notebook that you complete, um, or you might do an online version where you simply write your thoughts into perhaps a Word document. But there are all kinds of other um, ways of producing diaries. You can do fo photo diaries, video diaries, audio diaries, collages, drawings, anything, and a combination of these. You can give your participants flexibility to choose the medium according to what suits them. And there are also apps um, nowadays. And this is where the blurring happens because some people call it kind of electronic um, data app-based app data collection and others say no apps are part of diary research. So you yourselves can kind of decide where it fits in but the main thing is that it normally collects data over time in a relatively regular manner. So um, it's quite different if I ask someone to go and do a photo diary uh, that would be photos probably over a, a series of moments rather than saying go out and take uh, photos right now and bring them back. Uh, that would be a different kind of photo um, data collection. Um, the length of research um, is quite a um, controversial point within diary research as well. Um, and that's because, as I just noted, one of the things that m actually defines diary research is that um, diary uh, entries are recorded over time. Uh, so there's a a temporal aspect to diary research. Um, however, um, that length of time is highly debatable, and I'm going to say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but it can be very intensive over perhaps a day or a few days, or it can be longitudinal over um, even a, a year or two years. Um, so actually, there's no one length of diary research, but generally the idea is that you're collecting more than one instance of data rather than simply asking someone on the spot right then what what is your experience of something you're recording something over time it, it, the reason why i it really suits my um kind of standpoint on research is that i believe we are constantly dynamic and shifting that our identities subjectivities are experiences of the world constantly shift. So I like, I like a, a method that allows us to recognize that we're not the same every minute of our lives. Um, uh, it's, it is really quite useful diary method for exploring marginalized groups and sensitive topics. Um, and that, um, that can include um, in, our, in our book, as I mentioned, we have the, um, the study on marginalized groups in higher education, particularly focusing on uh, Dalit students, um, but we also have studies on bisexual and trans um, students in higher education, for example. And my research has uh, focused on caring responsibilities. So actually diaries can be pretty useful for things that people don't necessarily want to speak about. Um, and I would say as well that um, it's possible to adapt the diary form to people with different literacy requirements. So you might think you need someone who's highly literate to, to write a diary. Um, but um, it's amazing what people have done in the field of disability studies and also dementia studies. They've adapted the diary so that people can just 
find a way of expressing themselves um, the best that they they can. So if you are working with um, a, a group perhaps uh, who haven't received formal education, there are ways of using uh, photos or drawings or even collecting objects that can be included in a diary study. So it doesn't actually, it's not an exclusionary um, form. I think that's very important to, to note. So um, while um, I'm obviously talking to you today because I love diary research, I think it's fascinating and has a lot of potential, there are some challenges which are commonly recognised with diary research. One of them is participant recruitment. Um, often you, you can find people who are really excited about keeping a diary, but there may be quite a few in number. So um, you have to sell your study in a way that makes it appealing to people. Why would they want to record these things about their lives? Is it gonna help them in some way? Um, and you have to also um, probably recruit over the number that you want to keep because the second issue is that there's quite a lot of participant attrition, meaning that participants drop out during the study. So you, you have to sort of recruit a good number in the first place and then expect probably one or two or a few not to finish. Um, but you also have to be aware of the administrative burden of both managing the data um, that's coming in and also managing participant retention. Um, it, you have to put quite a lot of work into contacting participants to remind them, you know, you don't necessarily want to just collect the data all at the end. You might want them to submit you records as you go along and then you have to collate them and receive them. So there is a certain amount, it's probably more of a burden than doing a basic interview study. However, the, the, the quality of what you get can be really amazing. Um, there's also often quite a variation in quality and quantity of entries. Um, so you have some people who start with a lot and then they end up with tiny little one sentence things. You can end up with people who hardly write anything. You can end up with people who write everything because they forget the relevance um, of, you know, maybe you've asked them about their experiences of higher education. They start writing about what they've had for dinner. Um, you, you know, people can kind of get too carried away with it as well. So you, you do have that risk of different amounts of data coming in. There's also this challenge of the modification of behavior that results from diary keeping. And this in the health sciences field is a popular side of diary keeping because often um, diaries are kept in the health sciences around issues like addiction. Um, and they, uh, researchers find that when you keep a diary about um, something like addiction, that it can actually um, reduce your likelihood of, um, of using drugs or alcohol. Um, but on the other hand, in, in the education field, we don't like to think that our research affects people's lives. I think we might admit that it always does in some ways, but if you think that people are modifying their diary, it can be uh, their uh, behavior based on their diary keeping. It can be a bit of a, um, no, no um, kind of thing for social sciences. So you have to be aware that there, there is inevitably some modification of behavior. And finally, there are lots of ethical issues around diary research because people are writing a private uh, record of their lives. Sometimes it's on something really sensitive and then they're just handing it to you as a researcher. You're asking them to open up their lives to you and then you're just taking it and you're using it and you're publishing from it or you're submitting it as an assessment. So you have to be quite aware of the, the, the data that you're asking for and ask yourself, you know, how much do you need to talk to your participants about the quotes that you decide to use? You have to remind your participants that they are in a research study and that this isn't just their own personal private diary. So those are some of the challenges. Is it not moving on? There we go. Um, so as I've noted um, with diary research, there is a sort of dis disciplinary orientation um, towards the health sciences. And um, I'm, I'm aware of the center that I think you're all based in. I, don't, I think you're all based in more like um, education research, um, perhaps sociological educational research, depending on where you, you sit. 
And um, generally, diary research has been written about and developed more in this health sciences thing of around recovering from surgery or participating in some kind of um, health or well-being intervention. And that's where researchers are really simply just trying to understand what, what participants are doing so that they can improve treatment, deliver treatment, um, or um, so that, you know, maybe they can capture experiences that um, they can't actually access. You know, a health professional can't go every day to everybody's house to see how they are. So they can actually capture some of this um, sense of how people are on a day-to-day -day basis. But this might be quite different from our purpose of research. There have been some uh, diary method um, studies in, in uh, more like critical social sciences space. Um, and it does, this research does make a lot of sense in, in our disciplinary area. You know, it fits with participatory research. It fits with critical and feminist research methods. There is um, quite a, there's quite a bit of kind of publishing of diary studies, but there's not very much methodological writing. So people writing about how, into, how diaries work in critical social sciences studies, which is why we actually put together our edited book. But I have included a few studies here, which I think are particularly interesting. Um, so there are, um, there's a study of people who are doing street vending, and they kept diaries. That's an example of people who are kind of um, living very difficult and chaotic lives and often semi-literate, uh, but have uh, managed to do a diary study. And then there's, um, there was a study around um, the intersection between queerness and faith in higher education. So that's quite a sensitive area. Then Harvey's study uh, was actually about people's sex lives. She asked them to write diaries of their sexual um, relations and she called them private diaries because she actually never saw the diaries. She asked the participants to then discuss their diaries with her in interviews. So that's another way you can do it. And then SWIM, etc., did a study of everyday racism on campus. So these are just some studies to highlight the different ways you can use um, diaries within critical sociological research. So I'm going to now move on to um, a study um, that I conducted using diary research um, called In Two Places at Once. Um, and um, these were my research questions. So you have a sense of what this study was about. So I was interested in how academics, that is faculty members, how their caring responsibilities affect their attendance of and participation in conferences. And this is with the recognition that um, attending conferences is a kind of compulsory part of the academic profession. It's part of promotion, it's part of reputation building, it's part of learning as well about your field. And yet an awareness that um, not everybody can participate in conferences equally. I wanted to understand a bit more behind that. And I wanted to understand firstly, what it is about caring responsibilities that means that it's harder to attend conferences. I wanted to understand the strategies that faculty members use in order to, to manage their caring responsibilities while they're at conferences. And I also wanted to understand if this was different for international and domestic conferences. Um, and importantly, um, what I was trying to understand is not just if academics can go to conferences or not, but actually when they do go to conferences, what happens at the conference and how how do they manage the fact that they have whether it's uh, children or elderly relatives maybe they're caring for parents or they might have an ill uh, sibling for example how are they managing um, the fact that they have these responsibilities whether they are at home or accompanying them to the conference people care never stops so I was trying to understand how you can go to a conference and be at the conference and get what you need from the conference at the same time as managing everything that's happening at home. So those were my research questions. And um, the, uh, the kind of important thing about this study is that it, it's a short term phenomenon. Conferences, you know, they last a couple of days, maybe a day, uh, you know, think some of you yourselves might be managing some caring responsibilities during this event. They're a very short 
it's not like researching a whole academic year. It's not like researching a season of something. It's very much a few days. Um, and I use diary research, um, but it was perhaps a slightly controversial um, move because, um, as I noted earlier, often diary research is about how long your study is. It's a longitudinal study, maybe several months or several weeks at least. Um, but I thought it would be very useful for this particular phenomenon because I wanted to understand what was happening over actually more like hours and days rather than weeks and months. And I was reassured to learn from Bartlett and Milligan that there's no right or wrong period of time for keeping a diary. Um, a couple of examples of short diary studies, um, one, for example, about um, the 10 days following a birth and another of around three weeks over an assessment period in higher education. So it's not unusual to have a very short um, period for a diary, but um, what if it's just one day? Um, a second part of um, why my study was a little bit different as well for diary studies is that I was um, studying, you know, something called uh, an event contingent phenomenon. Um, now, this is another way in which diary studies can be quite different from each other. Um, so some diary studies involve recording something once a day at the end of the day or once a week at the end of the week or perhaps every hour. So they, those are regular diary studies. But event diary studies are about when you wait for something to happen and when it happens you write it down and if it doesn't happen then you don't write anything down. So um, it's actually called sampling. I know that in the research that you're familiar with, sampling is how you choose your participants. But in diary research, we have sampling for our participants, but we also have sampling for our diary entries. And with a regular diary, it's regular sampling. With an event-based diary, it's event sampling. And an example, a very obvious example of that is having asthma attacks or breastfeeding that every time you have an asthma attack you write it down or every time you feed your child you write it down uh, and you might you may be asked to write something about it uh, but if you don't have an asthma attack or you feed your child with a bottle for example you would not write anything down so uh, what I wanted to understand in my study is um, how um, while people were at um, their event at the conference um, when they were having care moments. So if they weren't thinking about their caring responsibilities and if they weren't um, actually um, maybe making a phone call or receiving a text message or going to check on their child, then they didn't write anything down. They only wrote something down if they had what I called a care uh, moment. So this was my overall research design. I used a diary interview um, method, um, which uh, involved initially setting up the study. Then um, the uh, participants um, kept a time log while they were at the conference. And then after the conference, we did an interview asking them more about their time log, but also asking them a general more general questions. So we were able to use the specific conference they'd attended and their time log for me to then understand more about their general um, conference and care practices. So that, that allowed us to get into more valuable detail. So this is a sort of, um, it, I've adapted it to make it a bit easier for you to see, but this is a, um, an example of Sort of what the time log the diary looked like so um this was someone who was attending a one-day conference and it was there was a lot of phone checking going on so she was checking her phone um, and she would make a note saying that she feels she has to have her phone on silent during the event but this means that she has to constantly check it because she's worried that she'll miss a call saying that something has happened to her child. So she constantly checks her phone and then she feels relief if there's no message because she realizes everything's okay and she hasn't missed it. Then she starts thinking ahead to the rest of the day and the care routine that she's going home to. So she checks her phone again to think, okay, in this amount of time I will be home. 
And then um, she's standing at the bus stop trying to go home from the conference and the bus is late and she's already thinking about the problems that her being away for the day and now being late home will make for her evening. So it was all pretty micro level um, detail, um, but it revealed to me the constant and everyday nature of care. I think if I asked people in general, if I took that single interview approach for my study, they would have said, oh, I go to conferences. Yeah, there's some issues, but it's fine. It's mainly OK. And what I found is actually throughout conferences um, that the faculty members were, were um, constantly worried. Um, they were constantly they were in two places at once, which is why I called the study this, because they were um, they were going through in their head what should be happening at home at the same time as attending the conference. Um, and this was uh, they were they were almost micromanaging the caring responsibilities from a distance. Um, so um, the kind of findings um, and I've I'm coming towards the end of my presentation, I should say. Um, the kind of findings that using the diary allowed me to find that I would not have found otherwise were these micro level details. And the faculty members were almost ashamed of some of the things that they wrote down. Um, they were, um, because you know they're sort of serious members of society and they were supposed to be professionals at these conferences. And at the same time, they were ashamed of some of the incidents that were happening um, throughout their day. So we have in this yellow box sort of what's supposed to be happening at the conference and then all the things that they were trying to squeeze in through the, this timetable. So, you know, you had kind of five text messages going back and forth. Uh, this checkup was a constant thing that I found out about through the diary that people were constantly worrying that everything was okay and mobile technology allowed them to constantly check that. There were also these unforeseen incidents. So there was um, a really difficult thing where um, a hairdresser messed up this um, participant's daughter's haircut. And this was embedded in a lot of um, family conflict because when she went away, she sent her daughter to her um, grandparents and the grandparents um, kind of had an argument about what should happen. And it was because this, um, this participant had a very complex um, international life that um, actually, although it was just a haircut, it led to her missing sessions and um, trying to sort out this incident with uh, the grandparents um, throughout the conference. And she traveled from Europe to the United States for that. So um, these unforeseen incidents were often quite sort of small or maybe even they seemed silly, but they were actually really um, important um, for how the care relations were managed. And there was also um, a second example of the kind of findings that came out were the way that people were constantly trying to win against time. They were trying to go to the conference and manage their care successfully at the same time. So we had a kind of sense of, oh, there's, a, there's been a, a technical hitch with the presentation, so I was able to check my phone, so I've won against time. And there was a session that someone couldn't understand anything, so they managed to catch up on buying birthday presents, so they felt they had they'd won. And um, then you can also see this picture of cakes um, that the person uh, was able to turn a tea time at the conference into a game um, over the phone with the family of um, asking her children to choose which cake she should select. They also, she also felt she was winning against time. She was succeeding at managing her care. Um, but there was also a lot of kind of a feeling of losing against time, where, for example, one um, participant um, spent the whole conference checking Facebook about an elderly relative who was about to die. So um, those are some examples of how the diary helped me to see really micro level, but very important details of how care is enacted. So um, the, ch Sorry, the challenge- Sorry, Emily? Yeah? Sorry, Emily, to interrupt you. Um, sure. Maybe could you could uh, wrap it up in another two minutes or something? If that's Certainly, enough. no worries. Thank you. Um, so just very quickly, the challenges of this study, one of them was that people recorded their, um, their information um, as quickly as possible in lots of different places. So they collated text messages, notes in their notebook, 
etc. Um, so they they were actually bringing together different sources of information into a diary they then presented to me. But I also felt that I added to the burden of care. Um, you know, people were on their phones, they were giving their presentations, and they were also trying to fill in the diary. So there was a burden of extra work. I also um, made participants more aware of the part of the difficulties they were facing. This was a positive finding for some. Some people took the diary and talked to their partners afterwards about how they felt that they, it was unfair about what they were doing, um, but others just felt more depressed actually about the difficulties they were facing. So that was a challenge. So um, in conclusion, um, I want to just touch on COVID very quickly. Um, so it's, um, as I said, diary method is a very diverse method. So some things are really well adapted to COVID conditions, others are not. So for example, the kind of in-depth collage diary, unless you can take a photo of it, um, the notebook diary is quite hard to uh, maintain and collect that kind of data in the conditions we're in at the moment. However, they can be used to collect in-depth, um, even sort of ethnographic type data from a distance. So that does make them really valuable at this current moment. And they're also so useful for tracking everyday life. And as we know, our lives are changing every minute with the way that COVID is happening. So it can be a great way of understanding from day to day how things are changing. But there are issues with diary method, um, using diary method during COVID. So firstly, how do you actually transfer personal diary content safely from the participant to the researcher, um, particularly if it might be um, actually making content contact to hand over a, a physical resource? How do you do that without risk of transmission? Or how do you transfer it safely over the internet? And that leads me to say also, can participants actually get use of the device they need to record their diaries as well as the data and the Wi-Fi? You know, I know a lot of our Haryana participants use one phone for their family. So how could they possibly do an audio diary about, for example, um, violence within the family? How could they do that on the family phone? So you have to be bear in mind those issues of security. But people are also really busy, really stressed and really worried during this period. And do we actually want to burden them with yet another thing to do? I think we need to think about that. So finally, um, I think, um, I, I hope that you've all thought, yeah, I, I could do this diary thing and it looks really interesting. Really important to do your homework on it though. Reading up on different ways of doing diary studies. There are so many different ways. I've included a lot of references here um, and you need to find a way that suits your topic and your participant group. You need to be aware of diary gatekeepers. Um, I've come across quite a few teachers and or examiners who don't think diaries work um, and who will um, potentially try and block you from using them. So you need to come back with all of the literature that you found and the, the plan that you've got if you want to use diaries um, and defend it against your uh, teacher or supervisor potentially. You need to always consider the ethics of diary research. So that's around security and privacy, whether or not the person can actually access your study and, and fill it into their potential, the workload created by diary research and the potential for diaries to make people change what they're doing, their reactive effects. And a final warning that if you use diary method once, as I did, you might be in it for life. Um, I think once you've started using it, it's really difficult to stop because it does so many things that other things don't do. Okay, so um, I will just show you my method, uh, my references slides, um, so you can have a look. I've shared my slides as well um, with Ekta, so she can um, share them with you afterwards. I'll leave that up for a minute and then I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for your attention and time and I'm looking forward to hopefully some uh, comments and questions. Don't, don't feel like you have to ask um, kind of really complicated question. If you've got any basic questions about this, I'd be happy to hear really anything you have to say. Thanks so much, Ekta. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for taking the time to uh, discuss in detail, especially your work as well in relation to uh, diary methods. In fact, that will be useful uh, in terms of asking specific questions, which I think will be helpful. So I'm, I'm going to take the liberty of being the host and asking the first question. Uh, no and problem. Definitely, uh, we have at least one question from Mira. Uh, and I would encourage other participants as well to post their questions in the chat window. Um, so uh, one of the things, Emily, that you mentioned uh, in your own research, it's very difficult to convince participants to, um, you know, sort of divulge their personal lives and uh, participate in the research like that, which seems uh, such an intimate process of 
uh, your internal thoughts and putting it out there. Uh, so what were your experiences of uh, uh, encouraging participants to be part of this? What is the kind of logic that did you, you use with your participants um, to be part of it? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I um, What was kind of interesting about this study is that everyone told me how difficult it was to recruit participants for a diary study. Um, but actually, um, I uh, was completely flooded with people who wanted to participate in this study. I think because so many people are struggling with issues of care and um, and conferences and um, because I was looking for academics, you know, they're already on loads of mailing lists. So I put out some requests and I was only looking for 20 people and I received 20 requests back within a day and I had to actually stop. I had 60 people write to me uh, wanting to participate. So it was a slightly different thing, but I supervise um, students also using this method and um, my, um, my student now colleague, uh, Shui Meng, the co-editor co of the book, um, she did a year long um, or nine month long study of master's students um, studying in the UK, Chinese master's students. And that was much harder to recruit people because um, she wanted to get them at the start of their course. And at the same time, she wanted them to um, complete their diary throughout the year. And one thing that she found that I think might be helpful to the rest of you um, as well is that, um, she found that the most effective, uh, there were two channels that were really effective for recruiting participants. One was to go through the official route. So she went to the um, department administrators in the university and asked them to put out an email. And because the students got that from the university, they felt, oh, this is a legitimate study. So they signed up from that. And the other thing was that she went and personally gave some presentations around the university about the study so people could see her and then they also went for that. Um, but I think the general sense is that people need to understand what the benefit is of them spending the time on this and often that is around greater self understanding um, of, of themselves um, and also contributing their voice. Um, I know that in uh, Nidhi Sabawal's study um, it was important to the, stu the students, the Dalit students felt unable to contribute their discrimination experiences in focus group discussions, but they felt able, they wanted to contribute their voices to the study through the diary because um, they could do it more anonymously. So yeah, that's, I uh, hope that answers your question. Sure, sure. I'm guessing it's also a process of Karthas is sort of, you know, the way you're sort of putting it out and it's just, I think, helpful in that sense. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, Mira has a question and she's saying that the diary method sounds very interesting and uh, exciting too, but how far is it accepted as a useful methods in research? I think you partly answered that question in your research, but please feel free to add more here. Yeah, certainly it is a really good question. Um, like I say, it's kind of halfway down on the most popular methods. Um, it's not completely wild. Uh, I think there are other methods that are considered sort of more um, extreme in a way. Um, but um, I think uh, going back to the very first thing I said that diaries are both unfamiliar as a method and familiar as a personal practice. I think we have to um, remind people that it's not just a, um, it's not just a personal practice that it can be a research um, kind of practice. And I think um, the reason why I keep doing, uh, I always accept present presentation invitations to, to talk about diary research and I always encourage students to use it is that I feel the more of us that do it and we, we have a kind of community and we can share uh, literature in general calling on literature to say look there are these books on this other people have used it um, I think we need to try and um, establish almost like a, a diary research community in order to make sure that um, we can have references to to cite so yeah I think that's um it's about um, building the field, um, as every other field has had to be built just earlier. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you mentioned this idea of community because in the morning session, I think this was pointed out uh, quite strongly that the communities of research need to be created for students to sort of uh, feel part of that as a community. And um, in that spirit, I wanted to check with you: Are there online communities for diary methods or research that you could share with the students as well? That in case they want to pursue this and know more, uh, they can be part of these communities. That that would be really helpful. Certainly, there is a Facebook group um, called Innovations in Diary Research. Um, okay. So, and that's, you can just 
it's a private group but you can request to join it so if you're on Facebook innovations in diary research and then when there are new things we, we post on that um, but I have actually been discussing with uh, with Zhui Meng, my co-editor the idea of setting up a mailing list um, so if we actually do that then we'll be in touch sure sure uh, Charles Avinash, I think, has a question. He says that I'm from Social Entrepreneurship School of Management. Uh, what are your thoughts on adapting diary methods to this field? Thank you so much, Charles, for that, that question. Um, I, um, I, I feel I'm aware of some use of diary research in that uh, field already um, around tracking behavior. Um, so I think it's not unheard of. Um, I think there is an issue, it depends on which part of a management school you're, you're part of, but um, I think there is some conservatism of method um, in that field. I don't know if I'm right in saying that, but um, I think it is um, it is already used um, for for some studies that I'm aware of. Um, but um, yeah, and I think it is again calling on the literature. That's the main thing I can say. But it should be possible to use it. Yeah. Uh, Charles, if you have specific questions or you want to elaborate more, please go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, hello, Dr. Henderson. Uh, nice to uh, read the session. So actually, ours is social entrepreneurship. So whatever entrepreneurship we do, uh, we take up the social problems, understand them, and then uh, give a uh, like entrepreneurial solution where the solution you know goes around that. So for us, our prime importance is of you know understand social problems. Uh, so for that, we actually use qualitative research. You know, recently we had a field immersion where we went to tribal areas in Maharashtra. And there actually we use this. Uh, so when, I, when you talk about diary research, actually we are, as researchers, we are keeping ourselves every day we write diary and so that we have a, a series of our observations. So I thought maybe we can dwell on this. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a very good thought on us so that we can develop this particular, whatever you're doing, we are not doing it in a very sophisticated way. Mm -hmm. But now, since you got an idea, like how we are doing it in a more organized way, maybe now we know how to take it forward. Yeah, I think it's actually an interesting point there about um, the researchers keeping in a diary and participants keeping a diary. Um, so I, um, I think there's, because we do keep research diaries or almost observation diaries and can, can we call it a diary research if we're almost keeping the diary for the participants? I think um, I think there is a bit of a difference there and what you're saying makes me think I need to um, be, that's maybe a boundary in diary research that is the participant that in some way records what's happening to them. So I think it would be very interesting for this kind of study if you found a way of the um, participants um, keeping regular um, tracking their their progress themselves in some way and reporting it back to you. That would give you even more insight into their lives, I think. Yeah, that's a very interesting um, question um, around um, that. Can we maintain a diary if we're studying um, thought processes? Um, so that can be thought processes while planning for a lesson, um, like what our teachers thought processes while planning for a lesson, for example. Um, and that's from, from Sharon, thank you. Yeah, um, I absolutely uh, I think that diary research can be used to track thought processes. And part of my study on care um, was around thinking about care. Um, so what I defined as a care moment could include suddenly worrying about what's happening. And I very much found that the faculty members in my study were thinking um, you know, there was someone who was in a conference keynote and they suddenly realized they wanted to, uh, they needed to buy something online um, and they just switched from the keynote and kind of bought it online. But it was their, the fact that they, their attention couldn't stay in the, the keynote. Um, and uh, it was that sort of how care was coming into their thoughts on and off during the day. And there are people who have researched um, diaries um, or emotions in via diaries. Um, there's a chapter on that um, in the book about um, thinking about writing. It's actually about doctoral writing, writing your doctoral dissertation and the feelings associated with it and how you track um, feelings which are actually very difficult to, to express and they're very 
quick you know you have a feeling one minute and it's gone so diaries can actually be very useful for saying when you have that feeling write something about it or try to capture your feelings during the day so they're very very well adapted for thinking about not just actions but thought processes as well that's a great question thanks Sharon uh, uh so I was if you don't mind uh just follow question yeah Please go uh, ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, so I was thinking more like, uh, how do you, uh, and uh, probably uh, this is something that I will have to read up on more, but I was thinking about how uh, probably it is a little more easier when to convince people to uh, maintain a diary uh, when it is something that uh, they would see an intrinsic value uh, in doing that, but sometimes, uh, how do you do that? Like, uh, I do understand that, you know, when you go to an Indian, in, in an Indian context, if you were to ask teachers to keep maintain a diary and which we have sort of tried in one of the studies that I was part of previously. And uh, we, we sort of saw that reluctance to commit to uh, this idea uh, because, you know, we had teachers just saying that, but what do I write? Uh, I don't know. I can tell you what I do. I could uh, sit with you for a couple of days and see what I do. Uh, but I, you know, uh, they were all very hesitant to maintain a diary per se. Mm. Uh, so uh, the question is more like, how do you make a case for it? And I understand if you know, it is not uh, something that can be answered in a short span and I should read about it more. Yeah. And it is a great question. I think it really depends on, um, on, on your participant group. It's hard to kind of um, generalize across. I think something that one might come across with asking people to keep diaries about their professional practice is um, a kind of unwillingness to um, go to dig into um, into professional practice um, you know that could almost reveal you to be not a very good professional I think there's some um, reluctance sometimes if people don't really want to record on paper or on the screen um, a record of their vulnerability and we are in diary studies asking people to be to reveal vulnerability potentially you know if you talking about the um, teacher uh, te teacher planning for example you know I know that if I'm planning a session you know there'll be parts that I'm not proud of you know I'll be I don't don't want to do it today I'm not going to do it today I'll have to do it tomorrow and I come to tomorrow I still don't want to do it uh, you know it says maybe it's a topic that I'm not clear on uh, I might be feeling ashamed of that and I, I can see that um, you, 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 with that sort of thing, you'd have to really reassure the participants that this is going to be totally private and that it's not part of evaluating their professional practice because people can feel like you're doing a diary in order to almost observe that the standard of their practice. Um, so you have to almost set it up like you can actually learn uh, you can learn about this, you can learn from your practice, and it's that dimension of di the dynamic and shifting nature, so it's explaining to people that you want to understand when is it more difficult, when is it easier, um, are there moments that they can almost find that would help them to uh, feel more confident or to improve their practice um, over time that you would not get if you just interviewed them once or even if you sat with them, but I don't know if that really uh, can help you, Sharon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the response. Having a go? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we have time for one last question. I'd be interested to know if anyone is now um, tempted uh, or thinking about using uh, diaries for their studies. I mean, definitely, I mean, not probably for my PhD at the moment, but maybe sometime in the future, uh, for sure. Yeah. Cool. I think um, Urbi says um, they're excited. That's great. <laughs> well, it's good to have some converts. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I could also, um, I have a, a paper which you might not have library access to but um, I have probably a free um, a copy of it I wonder if I, I could share the link if you want in the chat window that people could, sure. could access um, if I can find it easily I'm not sure if I can. and the group the Facebook group that you mentioned is innovations in diary methods right 
Yeah, I can check that right now as well if you want. Um, the PDF sure. of it as well. Sure. Oh, Ruby says they're already working on sociality, so diary methods will help. Okay, well, that's excellent to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, Ekta, I'm uh, hopefully coming, well, if we can ever travel again, um, as part of our Haryana project, uh, we're supposed to be coming to TIS um, in um, December. <laughs> um, if we can, <laughs> I don't know if there's any hope of doing that, but um, if uh, I will surely let you know um, if we're doing that and maybe we could come and talk to you about our um, project there as well. So um, certainly, that sounds if I really can meet some of the participants yeah. when I come as well. Sure, we can circ uh, We have the email address of mo most participants here. Yeah. Uh, so once you circulate details, I'll share it with all of them for sure. Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, thank, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emily, for taking the time. And it's certainly been very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And best of luck with the rest of the event. Thank you. Okay.